Virginia Trioli, it's great to be with you live from a very exuberant Melbourne tonight. Joining me on the panel, Artistic Director of Short Black Opera and Yorta Yorta Woman, Deborah Cheatham, Liberal Senator for New South Wales, Andrew Bragg, Lord Mayor of Sydney, Clover Moore, Shadow Minister for Climate Change and Energy and member for McMahon, Chris Bowen, who's locked down in Fairfield tonight, and author and founding director of the Sweatshop Literacy Movement, Michael Mohammed Ahmad, who's also joining us via Skype from Western Sydney. Please make them all very welcome. <laughs> Most of my relatives and friends work in either construction or traffic control. They live in the Fairfield LGA and they've been forced to either take annual leave or they've got no work. And $750 from the government just isn't going to cut it. We don't have the luxury of working from home. My uncle, for instance, has a wife and kids to look after and a mortgage to pay. On top of that, there is so much police right now in Fairfield and there are choppers in the air every couple of hours. It feels like we're being treated like criminals. We are so frustrated, we are angry and we are so depressed. When is the government going to end this lockdown, get the police out and, and now the army out and allow us to get back to work? So very frustrated and angry, Ron Al there. And Mohammed Ahmed, I'll, I'll start with you. Does that reflect any of the feeling you're picking up where you are? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, that question is complicated. Uh, I, I'm going to have to answer it from two ends. So firstly, uh, we have to talk about it from people's individual responsibilities during a, a crisis. Um, the other day, a gentleman that I read about tested positive for COVID but still thought it was a good idea to go out and um, buy a pair of dumbbells. Because, you know, during a global pandemic, the most important thing in the world is the size of your biceps. Um, we have to recognise that this is an incredibly serious situation. And um, the person that I've been thinking a lot about lately is Dr Jamal Rifi, who um, is a, a doctor in, um, in Belmore. And, uh, you know, he was, uh, he was present uh, when my grandmother passed away in 1997. He was there for her last breaths. And since then, he's been looking after my mum and dad into their senior years. He's been looking after uh, me and my five siblings, and he's looking after our kids. I'm not asking the people in Western Sydney or anywhere else in the country to listen to our politicians. I actually understand that they've let us down, that they've confused us. In many ways, they've betrayed us. But I am asking you to listen to the doctors in your neighbourhoods who have been looking after our families for generations. Mohammed, I'll, I, I'll, I'll leave it there for one yep. second. I just want to quickly hear from the panel. But it's interesting to hear that, that slightly different take, I guess, on the situation that Ron and others and you find yourselves in. Chris Bowen, your response to Ron? Yeah, thanks, Virginia. I certainly understand what is motivating Ron's comments. Uh, but uh, Mohammed is right. We do need to follow the medical advice. The medical advice is that lockdowns work. But certainly I think that um, in Fairfield's case, it has been tough. And I think a lot of people have misunderstood throughout wider Sydney what Fairfield has been dealing with. Uh, a lot of well-meaning journalists asked me at the beginning of this, why are the people of Fairfield still moving about? You know, why aren't they getting the, the message? It's not about getting the message. We have a very industrialised workforce, a heavily construction and transport-focused workforce. People can't work from home. And it has not been just good enough to say work from home. A lot of people, the vast majority of people in my community cannot work from home. I'm very glad that the economic support was lifted yesterday. I'd still like to see a modified JobKeeper back um, because that is the simplest way of getting people off the Centrelink queues. I was at the mm. Fairfield Centrelink office yesterday. The queues have not reduced since the lockdown began because the situation is very complicated. And the frustration for construction workers, I understand, of course, we'll support um, and implement all the health orders, but... You know, construction workers can't go to work in Fairfield. We probably have the healthiest construction workers in Australia being tested every three days. Um, and it's pretty frustrating that they can't go to work when other people in supermarkets, et cetera, can. So there needs to be a lot more clarity. And as for the announcement of the military tonight, well, um, local members haven't been consulted or informed as to what role they'll be playing. And if the military is going to play a role, I would suggest that community leaders and MPs need to be brought on um, on deck pretty quickly to explain what role the military will be playing, because Ron is right. I mean, there's a Polair helicopter over the top of my house four times a day. 
I understand what stress that provides, and military on the street, if not very sensitively and carefully handled, could add to that tension. Let's go to Clover Moore, because uh, I, I guess, Clover, it's your job to tell Ron that, um, as Chris Bowen indicated, because he's in one of those eight lockdown local government areas, even though construction is returning, he can't go to work. No, and it's, uh, I think what, was, what he described is the very grim scene and, and people are really, um, are, are really anxious and um, the $750 is, isn't going to, to do it. Um, and, and really, you know, what we need is everyone to get vaccinated so that uh, the lockdown uh, can, can, can be lifted. And, I mean, that, that's just the answer to all of this. And I think people feel really um, failed by, by government, by the federal government, for not getting that vaccine out to people and not communicating to them that it was absolutely essential that people get vaccinated. I mean, to think that, um, you know, the people who are now dying are, are unvaccinated and to think 25 per cent of people over 70 are not vaccinated just means there has been totally inadequate communication. And I think that this is what the people of Fairfield must be, be feeling. They're, they're being told now to stay at home and they have jobs that clearly aren't desk jobs uh, and, and they're, they're, they're totally angry and frustrated um, and, and yet, you know, the vaccination message just simply hasn't got out there, and that's because the vaccination hasn't been here. Um, you know, there's been a slight increase over the last week, but only 18 per cent of people are vaccinated now, and we need to get to 80 per cent before we can go back to normal. So what are we going to say to the person who called in? You're going to have an awful lot of t long time to wait if we're going to have to get to 80 per cent. So I think the situation is grim. There's no other way to describe it. Um, and, and really, I hope the federal government... Uh, I hope the Prime Minister's listening, because he's really got to get his act together and get that vaccination to us. And the thing I'd ask him to do is get on the phone to President Biden. You know, we're the, we're the willing ally. We go to war when the US wants us to go to war. You know, we're, we're you know, in a... What was just described in Fairfield as our type of war zone. And, and that's how many people feel. We okay. need the vaccine. Let, let, vaccine. Me, let, me go to, let me go to Senator Bragg, who's representing the government tonight. And there's a fair bit in that for you. Senator? Well, I mean, Ron... I mean, the, the first duty of government uh, is to look after its citizens. And when a government closes down a business, it needs to compensate that business. Now, if you're a sole trader, uh, if you're a, uh, a sparky or an electrician or you're a, a builder, I mean, uh, there are payments there. Um, I accept that the 1000 bucks a, a week for a sole trader is only going to be a temporary um, stopgap. I mean, I think there is more that we will have to do once we get through this pandemic uh, to help construction and to help traders get back on their feet. And, look, it's all well and good for people um, who have desk jobs to say, look, they can work from home. I mean, it's easy to walk into your kitchen table and put your computer down, but, I mean, many people like you, Ron, can't actually um, work from home. So I think we have a very heavy duty that we owe to you. Uh, but it is most important now, as Clover says, that we get on board with the vaccination. Uh, 200,000 in the last day, which is a record, mm. uh, including 80,000 in New South Wales. So... Whilst New South Wales is currently dealing with a very serious outbreak, um, on this uh, track, we're going to be the first out and the first to freedom. Deborah Cheatham? Well, I agree with much that has been said, and I just want to say to Ron, we really feel your pain. Uh, we've been through that here in, in Melbourne. Lockdown is a necessary but a blunt tool. And it, uh, it has a long tail. The industry I'm in, for instance, the arts industry, lockdown has a very long tail for us. And uh, many of my colleagues were not eligible for payments during that very long period last year and in the ensuing lockdowns this year. It is... The only way out is vaccination. And we need the federal government to step up and do the one job that has been given in this crisis, and that is to roll out the vaccination to Australian citizens. Clover Moore, uh, d does that strike you as, as unfair? As we've heard uh, mentioned already, the, the choppers in the air and the ADF on the ground as well cause great ructions in Melbourne. Your yeah. response? So so it sounds like a war zone. I mean, it would be terribly frightening for people. I mean, I think the other thing that should have happened that hasn't happened, it would seem, is that we have very effective promotion of vaccination and we do it in multilingual... Um, uh, it's multilingual and, and it's on um, the mainstream. It's also on social media so that people understand how important it is that they get vaccinated. And, and you know, if there's an issue about people not understanding, well, we, we, we make sure that we're communicating with people. We are the most multi 
multicultural nation. And, and I just want to say that um, since I've been mayor, I've made 25,000 people Australian citizens. And they, I, think, I, think uh, we're getting, I think we're getting way away from the question here. The question well, was about... I, I think the question, about the question... It was about Clovermore. It was about unequal treatment, that the, the cluster, the outbreak started in Bondi. Mm. There were never ADF boots on the ground in Bondi, but now we see them in, uh, in southern and western Sydney, just as we saw with the Housing Commission towers here in Melbourne. We never saw them at Turak. We saw them, uh, of course, at the Housing Commission towers. So how do you explain that different treatment? I, I can't explain it. Government would have to explain it. But what I can say is if they think people in southwestern Sydney don't know what they're meant to be doing, they should have effective multilingual campaigns. Uh, if they think people in western, southwestern Sydney are, are, are multicultural and, and don't understand English... Look, I, I just want to say that I think... Um, I've only seen one ad from the federal government, and I've got to say it was a very boring one. Um, but, you know, if, if you... you, you you want people to do something, you communicate with them. OK, well, let's hear from Deborah Chief. I think that. there are a set of assumptions here, and I just want to bring the point back to... Uh, Australia has a long history with, with over-policing. I mean, there's nothing that you can uh, tell me about that as an Aboriginal woman. Over-policing is uh, what is exactly happening here. The point was made, and rightly so, that the, the, this outbreak actually began in the eastern suburbs. If you scrutinise any group of people for long enough, you'll find something that annoys you or some behaviour that's not exactly exemplary. These people are being targeted. And we're targeting this problem. We're talking about it as, as a problem that belongs to immigrants. I'm sorry, but everybody who arrived here after 1788 is an immigrant. Is an immigrant, yes. So... It's, 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 but we're that, multicultural and, and we need to be able to... Clover, we need to Clover, understand. Clover, let, let, let Deborah speak. I, th I think if we could get the message right in English... First I, I all, agree. There we has get been it right so in English much confusion first. Yes. from the federal <laughs> let, me, let, let me go to Mohammed. Mohammed? Um, I have seen more police in my neighbourhood in the last couple of weeks than I have ever seen police in the rest of my life combined. Um, and if there's anything that anybody knows about Western Sydney is that it is the most culturally and linguistically diverse place mm -hmm. in the country. Mm -hmm. And also that it has always been seen as the culturally and linguistically diverse and socioeconomically disadvantaged side of Sydney. Yeah. And so it's very, very difficult for me and other members of our community not to think that the agenda in over-policing our community is built on, a, on racist and classist motivations. Let and me, I'll quickly let, say... Let, let I'll quickly just, say this. Let me finish sure, this, please. Yeah. Let me just finish this. I'll quickly say that we've seen time and time again that over-policing poor communities of colour is a recipe for disaster and the way the, the government can solve this problem is by treating everybody fairly and equally. Mm -hmm. uh, communicating I just, I, I, with no, them. No, <laughs> I just wanted to pick up with Mohammed there. Do you believe or do you know or understand whether communications with culled communities there uh, around in those local, go local government areas, has it been adequate? Has it been in many different languages? Has there been enough outreach? No, no. And, and the I, question and was I to Mohammed Clovermore. <laughs> Um, Mohammed? Um, I personally think it's the wrong question. Uh, it's not a question of whether the information has been communicated to us. We speak English. The actual problem is that no one is going to just come right out and admit there's a racist agenda. Uh, you know, the Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister of Australia, uh, John Howard, was saying the other day that he doesn't think there's an underlying race problem in Australia <laughs> after the 2005 Cronulla riots in which 5,000 white Australians were saying no lebs and physically assaulting anybody that was of Middle Eastern appearance. We have to start having honest conversations about the mistreatment of Indigenous people and people of colour if we want to have an honest conversation about how COVID is playing out in our society today. I, ben, very quickly, I just want to hear from Chris Bowen on this, because, again, this was another experience in Victoria where um, communities that weren't easily reached by language and also, of course, were the most exposed communities when it came to the kind of work that they did. As we've noted, they can't work from home. They are working in essential service industries. Has there been an adequate uh, understanding of that in New South Wales, that as a particular problem within the pandemic, both protecting those people and also protecting everyone else? Well, it's improved recently off a low base, Virginia. But firstly, can I just deal directly with the point that Chris Hale raised, because he's right. It was incredibly frustrating and has been incredibly frustrating to see those scenes in Bondi. I mean, I'm not trying to divide Sydney. On the contrary, I'm trying to unite Sydney to do the right thing. It's called the Bondi Cluster. We didn't start it in Fairfield, but to be out there... Um, to be out there on the weekend, as I was, and all the community leaders have been, explaining the people to people the need to follow the rules and then to see effectively a mass gathering at Bondi with people maybe technically exercising alone but 
coming together to exercise in big numbers was just wrong, should have been uh, better enforcement of that. It sent a terrible message to the rest of Sydney that, as I said before, we've got police helicopters over our houses, a heavy police have, uh, presence, that's fine, but it's got to be applied equally. The exercise rules at that point were the same in Bondi as they were in Fairfield, but they were very different scenes. You could find people in Fairfield complying with the rules, doing the right thing, uh, following every request and direction, terribly disheartening and frustrating to see those scenes. So I agree with Chris Hull. On the matter of communications, it has improved. I hear a lot of people say we need communications in language. That's 10% of it, Virginia. It's got to be not only in language. Yes, uh, Mohammed's right, English is important, but language is also important. But it's got to be taking into account the different circumstances. So take, for example, some cultural groups um, and people of um, particular heritage in my community, it is not uncommon to find a street of three or four houses in a row owned by cousins and brothers. When you talk to them about stay in your family, that's, you've got to communicate very, very yeah. carefully that actually you mean household, not family, yeah. because the rules have to be applied equally, but you have to really think through how you communicate it. It has improved recently, um, and, you know, over the last okay. days and weeks but off a very low base. And I just quickly want to hear from Senator Bragg on this, because I know that, yeah. that you hold a view that people were breaking the rules by going to each other's families and homes, but Chris Bowen has just put some context around that. Does that shift your view? Yeah. Look, and I, and I agree with what Chris is saying there on that point. I mean, but what I would say is that this is a risk-based approach. Now, when there was an outbreak on the northern beaches in Sydney, there were barricades and there were police. Uh, there has, have been police at Bondi, and there are police uh, at Fairfield, and this is a risk-based approach. Where there is transmission, uh, there will be uh, police. Now, I just say, in terms of the allegations of racism, I mean, the Premier of the state uh, is a daughter of refugees. She didn't speak English until she was five. So I, I just don't think that's a fair cop at all. <laughs> well, Virginia, just pray for... Uh, racism the predates uh, Gladys Berejiklian's reign. Hang on, just hearing from Deborah here, then we'll come to you, Chris. Deborah, sure. uh, I'm really so tired of... Having this conversation with members of the mostly the coalition government, racism is embedded in the very nature of Australia. And until we have those conversations that Mohammed was talking about before, we will never ever be a mature, a fully mature, emotionally mature nation. And uh, yes, Gladys is the daughter of, of, of migrants. Fair enough, but it predates Gladys and it's embedded very deeply and it will okay. take great courage to shake uh, the racism that, that fuels almost every conversation that I have. <laughs> Good evening, panel. Earlier this week, Senator Bragg floated the idea of a second early release of super to help those struggling with the COVID-19 pandemic. The last time this happened, there was an uptick in spending on non-essential items like gambling and alcohol. Knowing that this has a major effect on the long-term wealth of those who take the money out, is this the best option we have for dealing with the pandemic? Oh, on that point, Senator, I will come to you first of all. Nearly half of those who got access to their super last time around, they saw no drop in their income during COVID, but they took it out anyway. And, um, and as Daniel's just said, nearly two-thirds spent it on alcohol, mm. gambling and clothes. So you want us to have another dip? Well, Virginia, Virginia we have a $3 trillion superannuation system where you see $30 billion in fees go out every single year. Now, as we face this economic shock, I think it's only appropriate that the super funds uh, should be able to help Australians uh, if they want to do things like pay down mortgages. Now, last year when we had re early release, 60% of the money taken out was used to pay down debts like mortgages. So, so it would, is, you, after would you put all, some restrictions around money. it? Would you put restrictions around it, given that we saw how much of that was spent on on stuff that was not necessary in a pandemic? Would you put restrictions around it? Look, I'd be very happy to, to do that. But the point is that it's the people's money, right? So if people want to pay down their mortgage, um, they should be able to do that. It's an economic shock. It's their money. Um, I know Chris Bowen's championing it a bit to speak to this. I'm but, sure. Uh, Mohammed, is there anything you want to um, <laughs> add in here? Uh, just about the last two questions together. Look, Australia is an incredibly fortunate country. It can afford to look after all its citizens properly, and so that's what we should do. Yeah. Chris Bowen? Yeah. I agree. <laughs> it's a terrible idea from Andrew. Um, it is, frankly, offensive. Uh, I think it's morally bankrupt. The Liberals, and Andrew in particular, seem to have one solution when anybody's doing it tough, make them mortgage their future. Uh, I think it was outrageous that Andrew actually took ads out during the last lockdown and encourage people to access their super. 
Uh, you've got uh, half a million people who've got their super down to zero as a result of the last change. If you're doing it tough now, you should not have to raid your retirement income to get food on the table now. That is morally offensive. The only worst idea, worst idea I've heard is the Liberal government policy from a few months ago to encourage victims of domestic violence to raid their own super, which they were forced to back down. Uh, this is utterly outrageous. Superannuation is for a dignified retirement for all Australians of all incomes, workers included, and to force people or encourage people to live now to raid their super is morally reprehensible and it is absolutely outrageous that Andrew was encouraging people to do it. All right, I'll, I'm going to come back to the Senator for write a reply, but Deborah Cheatham, I did want to ask you, what does the average super fund of uh, an arts industry worker look like? <laughs> <laughs> Very slight, I would say. And I would also make the point that that I am the first generation of uh, Aboriginal citizens of this country who will live to claim their super, or at least I hope, if I survive Q&A this evening, that I will live to be able to... You're, you're doing all right so far. <laughs> ..that I'll live long enough to be able to claim super. So not everybody has enjoyed superannuation in this country. Um, and for First Nations people, this is something new. This is something to look forward to. And I think, in a way, also, I'd say this uh, dipping into super now, I think that that disadvantages young people in yet another way. Andrew Bragg, it seems friendless here on the panel tonight. I'm do not surprised. Do you want to have another go at defending it? Well, I mean, well, I, 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 you'll have to make the case that it's really necessary. The government, as you noted, is, is pumping a lot of money into supporting people and that's been uh, justly you know, celebrated and that's a good thing that the government is doing that. But going one more to, to the superannuation after what history has already taught us about it? Well, because superannuation is the people's money. It doesn't belong to the super fund managers it's, or it's, to it's, the unions it's, or the it's banks. The people's, it's the people's money for the future, <laughs> not it's for right money. now. It, but it's, it's their money, and if they want to pay down their mortgage, because uh, so having a house... So it's not superannuation, then? It's not super, it's something else. It's just a, it's just a slush fund of money well, that well, you have you, there. Well, as you know, Virginia, I mean, fewer and fewer Australians will be able to afford a house... Uh, and one of the things that uh, can be done with super is for people to pay down their mortgage. So that's what happened last year when we had early release. So I just think if people want to do that, why would we deny them that opportunity? I mean, so this, rather, this, rather than dealing with paternalism. Housing, rather than dealing with housing affordability, you actually yes. get rid of your money for retirement. Well, you, but you it's, can't it's, have both. It's their money. It's their money. I mean, this, this paternalism, I think, is very dangerous. I know Clover Moore wants to say something here. <laughs> Oh, well, I, I agree with what Chris Bowen said. And, and also, I think government should, governments should have policies about affordable housing. I think two issues that the Labor opposition must have policies on, because they're, they're a national issue, is, one, uh, giving wealthy retirees uh, tax refunds when they haven't paid any tax, uh, uh, uh. and, two, oh, uh, negative gearing... As a, as a tax system that encourages people who've already got a property to own multiple properties. If Labor doesn't want to address these issues and wants to just be Liberal light, then I'm afraid they're going to lose again. And if they lose again, I think they should get out of the game and let someone else have a go. To Chris, no. <laughs> directly there for you, Chris Bowen. Five I guess, minutes left. <laughs> I, I guess. I guess Stephen's really Happy saying. Birthday, Chris. Stephen's really saying, what's the point of Labor? Well, uh, I'm happy to talk about what Labor believes in. Uh, no, 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 you can, you can answer the question directly, which goes to the key changes you've just made, which uh, have been bedrock policies and points of difference from the coalition, and now you're saying, no, you're the same. So. Why? Uh, no, we're not uh, saying... No, well, well, I don't accept that premise, Virginia, but I, I'm more than happy to deal with Stephen's issue, but he did say, what does Labor believe in? But um, in terms of uh, the issues Stephen raised, um, look, we went to the last two elections in relation to negative gearing and the last election in relation to franking credits with policies. We also have to accept that we came second in those elections uh, and election defeats have consequences. It means you have to rethink your approach. It doesn't mean... For example, you walk away from caring about housing affordability. That means you think about the best way of achieving the same objective. So, I, Jason, I'm, so, I'm sorry to jump in there, Chris, but I've, I've got to pick you up on that. I mean, it was so interesting to hear from people like uh, Natural Shelter saying that you've now joined, they said, their list of enemies. And they, of course, are a peak organisation looking after housing affordability following that policy change. So you've now made enemies with the housing affordability organisation that you would hope 
to be standing shoulder to shoulder with during an election. So when it comes to housing affordability, you just blotted your copybook, according to... Well, I know Shelter well, and I've worked with them closely uh, in previous portfolios. Well, not, but not in the future, point, it would seem. Well, the point I was making, Virginia, if I could just make sure. the point, is that we do have a range of housing policies and we have more to come. We actually think the federal government has a role to play in housing affordability. We have a housing minister in the Cabinet, in Jason Clare. He's already put out the Housing Future Fund, $10 billion investment in uh, better housing, uh, and there's more to do. I, I completely agree with that. Um, housing affordability is a crisis. It does need to be dealt with, and the federal government needs to care about it. The difference is that a federal Labor government would care about it. Maybe the policies we uh, choose to pursue are to everybody's liking, like Stephen's, but we would be caring about housing affordability. You've got a federal government currently in office who just puts it all on state and local government. I don't think that is a, a, a sustainable way forward. I know Senator Bragg is dying to jump in here and you're going to get your, your shot, uh, let me tell you. But the, the paper, the local paper, the Melbourne paper today, The Age, was full of letters who were Labor members, fully paid up Labor, members of Labor, saying they're going to have to reconsider their membership because that they are their key principles that you're now abandoning in order to try and win election, I guess, at any ideological cost. Is that something you're really comfortable with? Well, again, I don't accept the premise that you just put, Virginia, and you can only really... I'm simply assert... quoting what they say in their letters, well, which is, you guys having made this change, I am now reconsidering my membership of Labor. Anyone can pick up the age today and see that letter there. Yep, and if you could just let me make my point in response to that. You can only really assess the comparative policies of both sides at an election. We've announced some, and we have many more to announce. And there are and will be many more real points of difference between the government and the alternative government. We will be providing an alternative, not an echo. In my own portfolio area, we believe the world's climate emergency is Australia's jobs opportunity. We believe in an ambitious climate policy. The team that Andrew's on is full of climate change deniers who veto any real action on climate change. There are a range of issues that will be real points of difference between the government okay. and the alternative government at the next election. And the Labor Party will go with a more focused, more prioritised but equally ambitious agenda for the nation at the next election. Senator Bragg, that's how you win elections these days in Australia, isn't it? No daylight between the main parties. Well, you've got to say it was a great Dorothy Dixon, so thanks, Stephen. But the... Uh, look, I mean, Chris was the architect of those two tax policies. They were bad policies and Labor has dispatched them. Uh, I mean, people took uh, Chris's advice and didn't vote for Labor last time, but that is now all in the past. So the question for Labor is really what is its agenda for growth? Because as far as I can see... They haven't got any policies for growth. I mean, we've got the patent box policy, investment allowances and the like, and uh, Labor doesn't seem to like those ideas. So I'm, I'm quite optimistic that with those tax changes out of the way, that Labor might actually put some positive uh, growth uh, accretive policies on the table. I, I, Clovermore wants to jump in, but I'm first going to go to Mohammed and ask him whether you've got any advice for the Labor Party on policies that they might uh, espouse that might pull back people like Stephen G. Um... I live in a suburb where a lot of young people will never be able to own a home and probably won't be able to pay off their hex debts. Um, so these conversations really bore me. <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling you might come up with something like that. <laughs> but you need then you need a major party that's going to stand up for those people you're speaking about then, Mohammed. You, you need them to come up with some sort of policy that speaks to you and those young people. I guess you're saying that neither of them do. Um, I haven't uh, felt represented by any of the politicians today. I only feel represented by my black sister who's on the panel today. OK. <laughs> what did you want to say, Clevermore? I wanted to say they were good policies. They just weren't told very well. I think if we'd had a, perhaps a Bob Hawke out there, um, we, you know, people might have voted for them. I, I just think they failed in to communicate well what those policies were about. They were about Australia's future. And I think people feel very disillusioned about what seems to be an abandonment of Australia's future. And as I said before, coming out of the pandemic, both, both sides should have very compassionate policies about the future for the Australian people, because people are going to be doing it really hard after this period of the pandemic. So a good policies, but a bad spruker, you think? Do they have a better spruker now? Well, uh, you know... Um, I won't comment on that. I'm just saying they were good Why policies. Why ever not? <laughs> Well, I, I, I just think, as I said, that both both sides should come up with, with, with policies for people coming out of a pandemic. And I think those policies would have been really fantastic for people coming out of a pandemic.
Deborah Sheet, I'm, I'm tempted to, to quote um, Hamilton here. We've, well, many of us have seen it. If you um, stand Not for nothing, Melbourne. what will you fall for? Yeah, exactly <laughs> that. Well... A couple of things. First of all, let's not forget Clive Palmer running interference. Was it all about franking credits and negative gearing? I don't know. Uh, those big yellow banners still haunt me and the interference that he ran. But I, I just want to say to both the major parties, there are tonight one million, more than one million Australian children living in poverty. Where's the policy for them? I know that's not the conversation tonight, but I want to put that there. And Chris Bone... If you are returned to uh, power at the next election, I want to see the arts reinstated as its own department, not some office or closet in infrastructure, roads and management and goodness knows what else. The arts need to be restated. Make that promise tonight and I will consider voting for you. Can you, <laughs> can you make that promise tonight, Chris Byrne? Well, I can certainly give a commitment that Tony Burke, as a very senior Cabinet Minister, will be the Minister of the Arts and he'll be a strong voice for the arts at the Cabinet table and it will be the centre not only of the bureaucracy but of the Cabinet, which is the most important thing. So I'm uh, more than happy to set up a conversation between Deborah and Tony, but the important thing is we'll have a very senior Cabinet Minister for the arts who believes it, breathes it and delivers on the commitments. Would you please thank our terrific panel, Deborah Cheatham, Andrew Bragg, Clover Moore, Chris Bowen and Michael Muhammad Ahmed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Well done.